On November 2nd, 2016, Unfound covered the disappearance of Joshua Guimond. His case is still unsolved. Now, in conjunction with the recent coverage by Dr. Grace Telesco of Nova Southeastern University, we re-released the original interview done with Patrick Marker, along with a new introduction and new summation in the hopes of reigniting the public's involvement in this case. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. I start this episode by asking you, if you haven't done it yet, to go to YouTube to the Fischler College of Education and School of Criminal Justice channel to watch the discussion Dr. Telesco and I had this past Monday, February 22nd, 2021, concerning Joshua's disappearance. It forms the base for the rest of this program, in which I will expound on some of the general topics covered in my talk with Grace. And please like that video and subscribe to the Fischler channel while you're at it. Also, as you listen again to the interview with Patrick Marker from Behind the Pine Curtain, I want you to think about what you've learned about disappearances over the last four and a half years. I am not trying to tell you what conclusion to reach. In fact, many different conclusions can be reached. Many viable theories still exist. Instead, I want you to apply what you think you've learned to Josh's case, one that stands alone in its own category among the 200 we've covered so far on Unfound. Does this feel like a murder to you? An accident that was covered up? An argument that went too far. A walk-off. What does your missing person's education tell you? And now the 2016 summary brought to you by my friend Megan Good's website, charlieproject.org. Joshua Guimond was a junior at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, majoring in political science. He had many friends, always looking to help them if they got into jams. His family has said Joshua hoped to have a future in law and politics. On November 9, 2002, he was at the Matin Court dormitory playing cards with friends. Around 11 p.m., he left the room, his friends thinking he was going to the bathroom. When he didn't return in a few minutes... They guessed he returned to his own dorm, St. Mar House, on the other side of the lake that sits on the St. John's campus. They called his dorm, but there was no answer. They thought he had gone to bed. The next day, his friends couldn't find Josh, and it was at this time they realized he had never reached his dorm the night before. In addition, his car on campus didn't look like it had been used. His glasses contact lenses, and credit cards were all left behind. Over the days and weeks, the campus lakes were searched by divers and the buildings were searched by dogs. Although there were some hits by the dogs at various locations, no signs of Josh or anything he had with him that night were found. Josh's family believes he met with foul play, with the focus being some research Josh was doing at the time regarding St. John's and its scandalous history. Unfound news. As I just mentioned, this past Monday, Dr. Telesco and I got together for another discussion. And I'll say it again. I enjoy the talks every time. If you're wondering, yes, I do use notes that are off screen to remember some of the details that we cover in each missing person's case. I don't do it all off the top of my head. Next, it's the end of February, so you know what that means. Yep, newsletter time. Be looking for it in your inbox on Monday, March 1st. 
If you are not on the email list, please contact me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Finally, due to the weird weather in the southeastern United States, Texas, Arkansas, etc., we've kind of gotten behind a little bit on our conversations and interviews with prospective guests. It's tough to talk to people when their power, internet, and cell phone service are out. But we're getting back to normal as I record this. I hope everyone who has been affected by the crazy snow and ice will recover quickly. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound supports accounts on Podomatic, iTunes, Spotify, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Deezer, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us for the Unfound live show. All of you can talk with me and I can answer your questions. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. This week, I need to thank Joseph. You can also contribute at PayPal, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. The email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Merchandise, the books at amazon.com in both ebook and print form. Do not forget the reviews. Shirts at unfound-podcast.myshopify.com or you can track down my assistant Heather in the Facebook group. Playing cards at makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. The website, theunfoundpodcast.com. And please mention unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm very happy to have on the show right now Patrick Marker of the website BehindThePineCurtain.com. Patrick, thank you for joining me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be on the show. Uh, there's so much to talk about when it comes to the, this subject matter, and I think the, the more we can more we can get the word out via any avenue, any channel is important, so I appreciate you having me on. You're welcome. I've portrayed uh, this case as a disappearance being intertwined with a conspiracy that goes, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a huge one, but it's also kind of an unknown one. I'd like you to talk about yourself and how you became involved in what has gone on at St. John's University over the past decades. Well, it was actually 25 years and one month ago that my case was made public in the media, the case of sexual abuse by a monk at the prep school on campus at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. The campus of Collegeville includes not only St. John's University, St. John's Prep School, it also is the home to what once was the largest Benedictine monastery, I believe in the world, certainly in North America, St. John's Abbey. It also includes an ecumenical center and a, a, um, the liturgical press, a, a large printing outfit on campus. So there's a lot going on on campus there in Collegeville. They have their own post office. They have their own, their own uh, fire department. Uh, they have their own incinerator and garbage plant. They have, they have, now they have their own solar farm. Um, most anything you need you can get on campus and within that community. And it's been a tight-knit community of monks primarily, but then those who were educators and students for, for decades, uh, for over 100 years, well over 100 years. Hmm. And so but 25 years ago and one month ago, uh, back in August of 1991, I decided that it was time to tell my story and to kind of break the break the lid, break the seal of secrecy that has been surrounding and over that that town of Collegeville for decades. I know that based on news reports that came out back in 91 that there were reports of misconduct in 1933. There was a murder about the same time on campus of a monk uh, killing another monk. Um, and this you know, whether it be abuse or misconduct, um, in, in one case murder, there are have been stories of 
of evil and darkness mm -hmm. you know, for at least the last 80 years. When my family used to take our summer, in the mid-70s, before we moved to Minnesota from the Seattle area, we actually spent the summers, uh, several summers in the late 70s, on the campus of St. John's University. And How did that come about? How did that come about, that well, you, from Washington to Minnesota? My parents were very good Catholics. In fact, um, from the time I can remember, certainly my first communion until I, my first part of my freshman year in college, I missed two Sundays of Mass. I was sick on one occasion, and we were at Yellowstone National Park on one occasion. And I took pride in the fact that I'd missed only two Sundays my entire life um, going to church. But I've more than made up for it because we would go because we were I was a Catholic student from age five until I graduated from high school. We went to mass sometimes daily, um, certainly in the grades five, six, seven, and eight. It was a daily thing mm -hmm. that we just did. And so my parents were very Catholic, and they'd gotten in very involved with the natural family planning and the marriage encounter weekends. And they heard about these conferences that were going on at St. John's University, and they. I don't know if they were asked to participate, but they did participate in these, um, the Human Life Center, it was called. And the Human Life Center was run by a monk, uh, Father Paul Marks. And my parents got to know him, and they got to know the, the Human Life Center uh, staff through these uh, conferences that would go on for two weeks, I believe, each summer. And so in 1976 and 77 and 78, we... We went out to St. John's for the two weeks. And in 79, the conferences were held in the San Francisco area, so we went there. And then back in 1980, we went back to St. John's, and my parents took part in the Human Life Center conferences. Well, the kids, there were five of us at the time, mm -hmm. we uh, walked the campus, enjoyed the campus, went swimming, caught fish, went to the library, and one of our favorite things to do was to go to the library and rent this, or not rent, but watch a video mm -hmm. about the ghosts of St. John's, about the cracks and the churches, huh. and about the chapel out on the lake that were scary. And it was this, this, this old videotape that we would rent, and we probably rented it every one of our trips out there, or, or viewed it anyway. But there was always this, it was interesting now, looking back, that back in the mid-70s, we were going to St. John's as kids, and the things that we would do... Um, we, we were very interested, at least I was anyway, in, in watching this tape. And we were all scared of these mm -hmm. ghosts of St. John's. And, uh -huh. and then years later, there were, they became real ghosts. Real of ghosts. St. John's yeah, that's, and, that's an excellent really. point, yes. Yeah. So in the summer of 1981, our, my parents were offered the job. They were offered the, the job of directing the Human Life Center, taking over for Father Paul Marks. And so we moved from Seattle area out to Minnesota. And. And I, and I ended up uh, attending school on campus at St. John's Prep School. It was then a school for grades 9 through 12, and now it's a school for 6 through 12. Mm -hmm. So we, I started school and um, was very homesick. And I'd grown up in, in the Seattle area. My, the first time I went to a football game, I remember, was uh, with, with a priest. The, a different priest taught me how to drive. I cut grass for a, th a third priest. Um, priests were at our house often, if not every week. I mean, we had the Archbishop from Seattle at our house. It was just something that we were very comfortable and we were, you know, good Catholics, mm -hmm. probably ab above average Catholics, I guess. And so, you know, when, it, when a priest said, hey, I, I noticed your you're you're not fitting in here, or I you know I'd like to talk to you. you. You seem to be having some problems adjusting. I welcome the opportunity for this man to 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 listen and to perhaps provide some answers and some help and support. Yeah. Yes. And for a long time he did that. Um, and and then at some point it took a turn that was less than therapeutic and less than beneficial to me and. Um, started a spiral of uh, misconduct and finally sexual abuse that was devastating. It was so devastating, in fact, that I don't recall thinking about it for six years. I know it affected me mm -hmm. because I've spoken 
I've realized some of the things that I did in college and I've spoken with people that I went to college with and after college. So I know it affected me. Mm -hmm. um, the abuse itself ended in 1983. It wasn't until 1989 that I actually realized what had happened through a series of nightmares and flashbacks. And I actually, here's where I have to thank mm -hmm. my perpetrator. I actually thank my perpetrator because he could have easily said to me, Pat, I never did that. But, huh. and those people who say, you know, repressed memory and, you know, those type of things aren't real. In my case, I don't know that it was a repressed memory, but I don't recall ever thinking about it. But when I did have to start dealing with it, the first phone call I made was to the priest, and I said, hey, I've got some issues here, and I need some help. And he admitted what he did, or at least validated what I did, and he apologized. But then he told me, and this was 1989, he told me that what he had done uh, certainly was, was wrong, but he asked me, I'm not even say that he asked me, he expressed a concern that if he told his superiors what he did to me, mm -hmm. that he would get kicked out of the monastery, he felt, because it had happened again. And I thought, at the time, I thought, oh, geez, I can't, I can't, I can't do anything with this. I don't want him mm -hmm. to get kicked out of the monastery. It didn't register in my mind that what he was telling me was that he had other victims. Right, right. And That's exactly what he was saying, right? Exactly, and I yeah. and so I, I, I didn't do anything with it. He said, I said, listen, I need, I need, I told him I had gone through counseling. It was only because I had gone through counseling that I, I had the strength to call him. I was actually lying to him. I, I needed counseling badly, and I ended up getting counseling later. But I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to hurt his feelings. I didn't want to hurt him. And so I said, listen, I'm, I'm better. I'm better. It's okay. But I just need help paying for it. He said, well, I can't help you pay for it because if, 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 if they know what happened to somebody else, they're gonna, they'll kick me out. So, that was, so, they, so the monastery already knew that this priest had done something to somebody else. Is, right. I, I bet then yours would be the second or third or fifth or tenth or whatever, and that would be enough to come kick him out. Once wasn't enough. It would take two or more or something. Right. That's very strange. Right. Well, as as you'll learn as, yeah. we, as we speak along and, and continue along here, it wasn't. Right. It's it's actually par for the course, and there are some people who are four, five, six times accused before right. finally something happens to them. Yes, the listeners are definitely going to get an earful. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, it, so, so I, I first contacted him in 1989, and then. Uh, didn't do anything with it for a while. And then the flashbacks continued. The re problems with the relationships continued. And I thought, you know what, it's time to, it's time to do something about this. And I remember being at a teaching conference. I was teaching at the time in, in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. And I was at a, a, a conference later in the, or later in the summer before the school year was to start. And I remember I was at the conference with my friend Mark, and we were eating, I believe, at a Perkins restaurant. And I picked up the USA Today newspaper, and I read a report about, the, I think it was the, uh, a meeting of bishops somewhere in the United States. And they talked about the prevalence, about the, the numbers involved with sexual abuse. Mm-hmm. And, and, this was, first... and this was 1989, which is still several years before the really huge blow-up in the Catholic Church in the United States. I believe it was the summer of 1990. So I'd, mm. I'd, I sat okay. on this for a year. I, I'd made the phone call, didn't want to do anything to rock the boat in this priest's world, kind of was, was trying to help him out. And then I believe it was the summer of 1990 that I was at this conference, and read the newspaper, saw the numbers, and thought, wow, I, I need to do something about this. This is, I can't sit on this because this means that other people are going to have issues mm -hmm. and, and are going to try to solve these problems on their own that really aren't their problems to solve. They, they need help just like I need help. And so I did something that was 
you know, I took the first step. I dialed 1-800-LAWYERS because I, I'd seen a billboard or mm-hmm. a phone book or something. I didn't know who mm-hmm. to call. Mm-hmm. I dialed 1-800-LAWYERS, and I got in touch with this lawyer named Bob, and Bob and I met on a couple of occasions, and he said, listen, this is, this is too big for me. I, I, this, isn't, this isn't something that I do. And so he, he uh, put me in touch with a, a lawyer that he knew of by the name of Jeff Anderson, and that was, I believe, in the summer of 1990. And then in uh, the August of 1991, my lawsuit was filed. And that. And how, were, how that, old were you at the time that, that this, been, that the filing of the, this lawsuit? How old were you at the time? I would have been 26. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it was. That was the. Hmm. I don't know if that was the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of the middle, but I can mm. tell you that every the ninety percent of my motivation for what I've done over the past twenty five years mm-hmm. came from a comment that Father Dan Ward, lawyer for St. John's and the St. John's monks at the time, he himself was a monk, mm-hmm. but he was also a canon lawyer. And he represented some of the monks. He represented my perpetrator. And he stood on the, the uh, steps of the Abbey Church being interviewed by a reporter. And he said that St. John's would deny all of these allegations. They didn't want to play it out in the media. They, they, you know, let mm-hmm. things take their course. But the fact that he was willing, after my perpetrator said to me, that he was sorry, and that, yeah, what he did to me was wrong, but that he couldn't help me. And then this man to stand up and announce to the public that they denied the allegations. So essentially calling you a liar. Essentially calling me a liar. That was uh, that was a turning point for me. I mean, that was a scary day. At that point, I was still John Doe. They didn't show my face. They showed the mm-hmm. back of my head. And I was on camera for a bit, and... And I told a little bit of my story, and it was shared on the news. And all of a sudden, I was this John Doe, and nobody knew who I was. And to have this man then say, you know, this what he what this man is not saying is, or what this man is saying is not true. You know that that yeah. motivated me. Yeah, I bet and it would. It motivated me to find out what other secrets were there were they hiding. So August of 1991 was the first step in me deciding it was time to learn the truth about St. John's. And so this 25-year journey has led me to a lot of truths. It's led me through uh, many lies. Uh, It's led me through a lot of dark stories. This weekend when I was in Minnesota, I was explaining to some friends of mine that I've spoken that I tell people that I've spoken with over 200 victims of misconduct at St. John's. Mm -hmm. And because I trust these people and they know me, I I backed up and I said, you know what? I've got to tell you the truth. I I tell people it's 200 because I I know that if I tell them the truth, they won't, that it's, it's almost, Mm -hmm. it is unbelievable. If I tell people that over the last 25 years, I've spoken with 300 victims of misconduct, it's almost too big for them to wrap their, arms around and they think, oh, he must be lying. Yeah. And unless you're involved with victims of sexual abuse and misconduct, and unless you understand the, the dynamics and the realities at St. John's, 300 is impossible. 200 is, is ridiculous. Yeah. But then you do the math and you realize that, that just a few years ago, St. John's had on their website they said there have been 23 men who have been credibly accused of misconduct. Well, 23 perpetrators. You would ask most abuse support groups, um, advocates. You say, well, if, if a perpetrator's name is made public, the average number of victims they have is how many? And the number is usually 10. And we know that Finian McDonald, one of the monks at St. John's, is also a priest, but he's a monk from St. John's. Mm-hmm. He admitted to having over 200 sexual uh, encounters. 
different people, many of them minors. So, all from so the prep school that you... No, no, all, no, most of them from his overseas travel. Okay. But he had many victims at St. John's University and many victims from St. John's prep school. And probably, you know, there are other things that happened on campus. There were leadership camps, music camps, uh, the boys' choir, all sorts of retreats. And just the number of people who went through that campus stayed on campus, lived on campus, worked on campus. It was a, you know, going, taking from a 1980s movie, I think it was a target rich environment for mm -hmm. perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so going back to the numbers though, if you say John's on their website admitted to 23 perpetrators. Well, if you, if you take even the small you know, the average number of, of 10 perpetrators per, or 10 victims yeah. for a perpetrator, yeah. you get to 230 right there. Well, I, I know for a fact that my, I mean, I've spoken with over a dozen victims of my own perpetrator. I've spoken with over a dozen victims of several other perpetrators. Um, so a dozen you know, each. A, a, you, when you say a dozen, you don't mean dozen over 12 per, per you dozen for, yeah. per one per one perpetrator. And I'm going to go back on that. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go back on my perpetrator and I'm going to say that if you do the math regarding the average number of victims that a perpetrator has and you look at what the St. John's had published on their website a few years ago before they took it down of course mm -hmm. that they had 23 perpetrators who had been part of their community. Well, if your average perpetrator has 10 victims, then you're up over 200 victims already. But we know from experience, my perpetrator and other perpetrators on campus, they had approaching a dozen or 15 or possibly 20 mm. victims. So the numbers get high very quickly. Yeah. And, and St. John's, while they've admitted to having 23 perpetrators in their midst, my website makes it clear that that number is low. And I believe the number of perpetrators who has, or I, be, I believe that the number of perpetrators who have come through the St. John system is approaching a hundred now, whether it be monks uh, on campus, whether it be visiting priests who have come to the School of Theology, uh, whether it be lay people on campus um, whether uh, it be, you know, I, I talked about visiting monks. There were mm -hmm. a couple of visiting monks who uh, who showed up to get an education, and they abused while they're on campus. It's like, how in the world do these people end up at St. John's? Certainly, St. John's isn't the only place in the world that where sex abuse was a problem. Right. But I would I would challenge anyone to find a concentrated community of offenders and a place that was so attractive to other offenders with numbers higher than St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota. And I, I yeah. challenge them and believe I will win that challenge because I don't believe there's a higher concentration of sexual perpetrators than what I have discovered on that campus over the last several decades in fact you could say that maybe that the reason that's the case is because the priests who were there were telling other ones to come there probably the culture at st john's has this, this the culture at st john's has not been and continues to not be healthy with regard to sexuality and it's been that way for several decades. The type of person that was attracted to come to St. John's uh, to become a monk and to study uh, in the School of Theology, that, the type of person that was attracted here and was, was different. Mm -hmm. um, how to explain different? I can tell you this. Mm -hmm. While I've gone about my research, over the last 25 years. I've spoken with hundreds of victims. I've spoken also with dozens of monks who left 
the monastery. And the reason they left is this, in almost every instance, is because they didn't want to be a part of the problem. They realized what was going on mm -hmm. on campus. They realized what was going on in the monastery. It wasn't Catholicism that was being taught at St. John's. It was this radical view of, of Christianity. It was actually, it was a, not even, a, it was a radical view of selfishness and what can the church do for me and what can I get as a member of the St. John's community. The, the, the hmm. St. John's attracted a lot of well-intentioned men and most of those men left. And the people that stayed behind were the weaker, the I don't, I don't know, the more susceptible, the more controllable, the uh, people that just wanted to go along with the program. Yeah, the men, who, the men who weren't strong enough to leave became mm -hmm. part of a system that compromised people, compromised their own community of monks, and then it compromised the community of believers, and then it compromised a population of young people through sexual abuse, misconduct, and control that has left a, a very black cloud that exists to mm -hmm. this day over St. John's. And there are so many Johnny loyalists. They bleed Johnny red. And God mm -hmm. bless them. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic to be loyal to a university and to a campus and to a cause. But when you turn a blind eye, when the St. John says on their website that we have 23 credibly accused, and nobody pays attention to it. Or that there's lawsuit after lawsuit in the public eye, and nobody pays attention to it. Or one of the students disappears from campus, mm -hmm. and it's treated as though somebody lost the key. You know, well, let's look for it for a few days, and then let's pretend it didn't happen. And that's what's happened, is we, we're pretending that Joshua Guimon never disappeared. And, and that has to change. Attention needs to be paid to all of these things. Attention has to be a pay, attention has to be paid to a campus um, and an environment that is toxic and that is is just so debilitating. Um, there are people <laughs> it, it's just amazing Ah, I don't even, that's, I don't even mm. want to go with that. I mean, it's just, it's amazing the number of people who are loyal to St. John's but can't stand the place. They, they have not, they, their parents work there. They work there. I mean, I've spoken with current employees who, I mean, this, are, this is what they do. Where, where else are they going to work? You know, mm. there, if, you, if you work there, you get free tuition. So I can't, I can't blow the whistle. I can't. Yeah. I can't, can't stop. I can't stop donating. I, they'll know. In fact, if you go to my website behind the pine curtain, and somebody uh, within the leadership finds out about it, you will have a consequence. I mean, it's it's. There have been memos sent out about visiting the behind the pine curtain website. You know, it's just there's such mm. this. There's a fear. You know, and it, it the, and the point is, is that it's just not you know. For example, students that they're there, but even afterwards, once they graduate, and even if they find out, even if they're there and they never even knew that all the sexual abuse has gone on for the last how many decades, they still remain loyal to St. John's University. Well, and to an extent, they should remain loyal because that's their university. In fact, mm. I've been accused several times of, of, you know, picking on the university. When they say, well, well, it's not the university, it's, it's the monks. And, and the monks were the university for a long time. And the monks are still part of the university. And, and these, these people who support the football team and support the basketball team and, and love the, the way the leaves turn in the fall and can't wait to come out. 
you know, it's, it's a beautiful campus, but what people don't realize, and this is what I've been saying forever, there's so much deception and there have been so many lies told and there's been so much abuse on campus. If we were to have gone back to 1989 or 1991 when I came forward and started mm -hmm. fixing this, or there was a major lawsuit settled in October or a series of lawsuits that were settled in uh, 2002, in October of 2002. There were more lawsuits uh, settled in 2012. You know, take any one of those dates, 1991 or 2002 or 2013, at any point in there, we could have started um, telling the truth. We could have worked toward full disclosure. But instead, they've decided to try to hide the truth and try to cover up what's actually gone on there. And all they're doing is delaying the inevitable. I, I've said for years now that we must, we must tell the truth, dig it up, and then bury it properly. Mm -hmm. And then we can move on. But because they're so afraid of telling the truth, because it is going to have some major ramification, because that means that their list of 23 is incorrect my list of almost 100 is a correct. And there's a lot of fallout that's going to come when, when they admit that the number is actually closer to 100 than it is to their 23. And they'd like the public to believe that it's a low number and that it's all been dealt with and that the perpetrators are on these uh, safety plans and that they can't travel unless they're escorted and that there's really no issues and that nothing's happened in the last several years or sorry, nothing's happened in the last 20 years they try to tell people mm -hmm. um discounting the fact that that just a couple of years ago one of the priests did miss did uh, was credibly accused of misconduct on campus and he uh, and this is within the last five years he was removed from campus and was sent to Missouri, where uh, the, the worst of the monk pedophiles, the priest pedophiles, actually go for treatment. And this was within the last 10 years. This happened, I believe, in the last five years. But it, they don't want to tell that truth because that truth brings consequences. And that's something that St. John's uh, wants to avoid because they've, they keep telling their constituents that it's in the past, it's in the past. Why don't the American people know more about this? Given the even if it's just twenty three, which is still horrible, why don't the American people know about this? Is it because it's not, you know, to draw another example, Penn State, or because it's not a huge school, or is it because it's in Minnesota and not in California? What insight do you have on that? Because it's an incredible, disturbing story. Well, there are other. There are other stories like it around the country, mm -hmm. certainly you know, Boston, uh, number one. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just people don't want to hear the story. They don't, you, you don't, very rarely do you read a story like this and say, hey, I want more information about that, unless it happened to someone in the family or to you. So in a way, um, I would say to answer your question, mm -hmm. all of those things. And in addition, people are burned out by it, um, mm -hmm. and that's a sad that's a sad truth that people have heard this story so many times that they don't want to hear it again. But when it affects family members and when it affects your, it affects your community, um, you you need to pay attention. Uh, there are so many secondary victims of these types of crimes of this type of conduct and misconduct that it, it is really affecting. An entire community, certainly the entire St. John's community has been affected by it. And people will say, oh, everything's fine. It's in the past. But no, that's not that's not true. And there's this it would be nice to it would be nice if it was. And I'm all for that. I've offered my services many times to try to help clean things up on campus. Mm -hmm. um, one of the last times I was on campus um, was was my my 30 year class reunion back in 2013. I was excited to go there. I, I, I was hmm. so looking forward to this reunion, and, and, you know, spending time with these classmates of mine I hadn't seen in 30 years. I contacted many of them as part of my research, but it was all discussion about abuse and misconduct. And it, rarely did we talk about 
you know, the baseball team and, mm. and school events. It was all focused on one thing. And certainly I hadn't spoken to them about my family or going salmon fishing or doing the things that I did as an adult. So I was looking forward to connecting with these classmates of mine. And so I went to the reunion and was sitting down at, at a table enjoying my lunch. Uh, I think there were seven other of my classmates there. And, and there were uh, alumni from different uh, years as well. So there was a good crowd out in front of the, the St. John's Prep School. And we were enjoying the lunch and had just listened to a presentation by one of the monks before the lunch. But there we were under the tents in the sun, um, eating lunch, and I saw some security guards approaching. And I thought, well, this, this could be interesting. Because <laughs> they were looking at me. And I thought, all right, well, let's, let's see how this plays out. So one of the, the security guards came over to me and said, Mr. Marker. I said, yes. He said, you need to leave. You've been asked to leave campus. And I said, I said leave? I've, I've just got here. You know, I'm having lunch. Go away. Mm-hmm. He says, no, you've been trespassed. You must leave. I said, wait a minute. He said, I have a ticket. And I showed him my ticket. And I said, I'm eating lunch. I'm going to finish my lunch. And then I'm, I, I will leave after that. He says, no, you'll need to leave right now. If you don't, I'll call the sheriff. And all right. Well, I said, call the sheriff. I, I would welcome that. And I'm going to get back to my lunch. So I continued eating my lunch. And the sheriff showed up. And as the sheriff walked over, the security guard for St. John's announced to the sheriff. I shouldn't say announced. He said Hmm. loud enough for the rest of the people at the reunion to hear that I had a restraining order against me and I wasn't allowed on campus. And that was a a lie, a complete lie. There had never been a restraining order placed on me, nor had I ever been trespassed by St. John's. But he made this announcement to the sheriff and to to the people that within your shot that, that I had a restraining order and the sheriff asked me to come over to his vehicle in the parking lot and I did so and the security guard again said that I had a restraining order and the sheriff said that I would have to leave and so I said okay I will do that and they asked where my car was I said I didn't have one I said that the person I came with that they were still enjoying their lunch and I didn't want to interrupt them and so I walked off campus, and if you know the campus, the St. John's Prep School, where we were, is toward the back of the campus. And so I walked down the hill and in front of the Abbey Church and past the football field, and, and out I walked. Wow. And, and you never, when you were going this, this never occurred to, to you that this might happen before you got there, especially considering your history with the school. I've always been respectful of the people on campus, the jobs that they have to do. I've never interrupted a mass. I've Mm. never shouted something. I've never held up a sign. I've never protested. I realize that, you know, they have a job to do, and and that's not in my best interest, and it's not the best way to get the word out. Mm. And for that day, the thing that I had been looking for, forward to was spending time with my classmates and it never occurred to me that they would try to do this hmm. I had a feeling the the headmaster the principal if you will the headmaster of the school um, it, it didn't help that a month or so before that I had made public the fact that he had been credibly accused of misconduct. Yeah, that wouldn't so help. That probably didn't help things. Right. But it was true. In fact, in 2003, I was on a review board with this gentleman, Father Jonathan Lakari, and he was. Re- I was on a review board. And the the goal of the re- the mission of the review board was to help clean up the issue of sexual abuse on campus. And I was named to this review board. There were nine members of the of the board. And and after the third meeting of this review board, we met every month. I flew from Seattle to Minnesota every month for three years. And after the third month that we met in 2003, this priest, Jonathan Lakari, was removed from the board. And he was removed from the board because of an incident of mixed conduct with an underage female at a parish 
uh, or while he was working at a parish in the Minneapolis area. Mm -hmm. And this is why he was removed from the review board. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and then 10 years later, he gets a job as the headmaster at St. John's Prep School. And I wrote a letter to the abbot saying that that was a wholly inappropriate position for this man to be in because the same people that he was going to be overseeing, they were the same age as his minor victim at the time he was removed from the review board. In addition, because there was a history of misconduct with Father Jonathan McCarty, it would be devastating if another incident were to arise because they would have had previous notice. Right. I suggested that it was, it was suicide for the prep school to name this man as headmaster. But they went forward with it. And in fact, to this day, three years later, he remains headmaster at prep, the prep school. And it's a ticking time bomb. I, I, yeah. I worry about the students at that school, and I worry about the community of St. John's with he, his position. So, mm -hmm. and I believe, and have been told, that I believe that he was part of the effort to have me expelled from campus that day, and that it was a calculated, um, it was set up, that it was something that was mm -hmm. planned, and it was, you know, it was set in place before I even walked on campus that day. Well, given all this, and we've got a we've got a nice setup uh, for where we're going about to go next, mm -hmm. and that is so Josh Gweeman shows up at St. John's University, and he disappears in two thousand two. What was he doing there? Do we know anything about? Did he know about any of this when he became a student there, and then? Why is it that there are many people, myself, maybe yourself included, who think that all of this might have something to do with Joshua's disappearance? What what might have made what he him do, being there? What might have made him uh, disappear on campus, possibly? Well, Joshua Gimon was a student at St. John's University, mm -hmm. and. There are so many possibilities of what could have happened to Josh. And we know that it wasn't just minors that the perpetrators on campus were attracted to. There's been a long history of misconduct um, by monks on campus with uh, college students, a long history of it. And St. John's doesn't want people to know that history. In fact, they, they, they spent a lot of time. Early on, they, they listed the names of those monks who had been credibly accused of sexual misconduct with non-minors, with adults, with college students. But then, as time went on, they realized that, hey, the, it's, our numbers will go down if we just concentrate on um, the, the monks who were credibly accused of misconduct with minors. So they, they stopped talking about misconduct with college students. And there, there are more college, I, I, I believe, and I'd have to check my notes on it mm. to my research, but I think there have been at least as many, if not more, college students uh, victims of misconduct than minors on campus. So, so we're so, talking about when we say college students, we mean adults, 18 and over, inappropriate right. but not technically illegal. Right. Okay. That's exactly right. Okay. okay. So that so St. John's is really trying to press that that difference there, and that's you know mm -hmm. that's just the way they've they've done their business. Is that misconduct misconduct by a monk with a minor isn't as bad as sexual misconduct with a college student, which is just hogwash. But yeah, they it, it's it's been in their favor and to their advantage to look at it as a a legal issue than an ethical issue. And, okay. and so that's the that's always been the the issue at St. John's. But let's be clear about that. something being that we're talking you know talking about Josh Gweeman. There's no evidence out there that he was ever abused by a monk, he ever had an, a relationship with anybody at the facility there whether it's a male or a female. There's no allegations there, of that at all. There's, 
there are no allegations that he was a victim of misconduct. He certainly knew uh, the population of monks. He had them as teachers. He had them as, as uh, resident uh, advisor or faculty residents mm -hmm. living in his dorm. Uh, uh, he was uh, friends with one of the monks, uh, Brother Willie, and... I'm told that he was the night watchman on campus, uh, officially or unofficially, uh, that had been mm -hmm. his role at one point. And he was one of the older guard and that he, uh, I'm told that he and Josh shared stories and, and uh, got along quite well. Mm -hmm. But no, there was, there, no. Josh was never targeted that I am aware of, nor a victim of it. Although mm -hmm. he would have come across in just his day-to-day -day business, uh, several monk perpetrators because they were still and are still on campus and still 14 years later they're still there still there sure okay um and so he would have certainly been exposed to them would have crossed paths with them and and so would have had interaction with some of the named perpetrators on campus and so what we also know that about Joshua is he was doing some sort of research paper into all of this. According to his parents, yes, there was mm -hmm. a, a research project that he was either interested in or had already begun on a sexual abuse on campus. And not the abuse itself, but the cover-up, that he had been very frustrated. Um, Josh was, uh, a, a, had a sense of justice about him. He, he knew right from wrong, and he was frustrated when people were treated unfairly. Um, he represented, I'm told, his friends, when his friends would come up, you know, when, even when they were, even when something went wrong that they were responsible for, he was there to assist them to, uh, to get, uh, to help them work through their issues. He had a, um, you know, the thing I'm trying to, he would help, I and mean, I'm told he helped somebody get out of a speeding ticket, for instance. Hmm. Uh, if they were accused of, if, if one of his friends was accused of something, he was kind of like the go-to guy. He was the in-house, unofficial lawyer for the group where he would help people uh, say the right thing or do the right thing in order to minimize the effect of what they had done, to minimize their sentence. Mm -hmm. So he was, you know, he, he knew the system. He knew how to work the system. Uh, and uh, he tried to help as many people as he could. But he didn't find out about what was going on at St. John's University until he got there. Right? He It wasn't yeah. like his uh, – I don't know who was paying for his education, but um, his parents or he didn't know about this until he got there from all we know. Oh, certainly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, and, and most people don't. Even there are people on campus right now who – their parents who sent their students there. Some of their – some of these parents, I get emails all the time. You know, I've been there for three years. I had no idea that this stuff is part of St. John's past. I mean, it's just amazing the emails right. that I receive. The people say, I have no idea. What can I do? I mean, this is, this is mad. I mean, it, just, it doesn't make any sense for this long history, this, this fine institution to have this long history, and yet nobody knows about it. So yeah, that's why I asked you before about, you know, how is it that a lot of people still don't know? And there's actually people going there that are just now finding out about it, you know. There are people are going there who will – I mean, they're at school. It's, it's now late September. Hmm. They are on campus right now as a freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior. They don't know about the previous abuse. They don't know that they've already walked past two credibly accused perpetrators of sexual misconduct – today and mm. by the time they graduate they still may not know about it wow so we have josh he's doing this paper was he doing it for a class or was he doing it on his own well again i'm I, i'm working only on what the family's told yes me here. i understand that I he understand was working that. on it for a class uh, and that's as much as i know about that that he was interested and in, uh by the amount of misconduct that had occurred on campus and that he was doing a paper on it. And there are also allegations that somebody got into his computer after he left, after he disappeared. Well, is there are a couple points in, with that. Yes. First of all, there is evidence that after Joshua disappeared, items were 
erased from his hard drive. I think that's fairly well known and mm -hmm. an established fact. Okay. Beyond that, there's, you know, there have been things found on his hard drive, um, fake IDs. Uh, even. So in 2010, I had access to Joshua Gimon's hard drive. By this time, the Stearns County Sheriff had already looked at it and a professor from St. Cloud State University had had, had, had access to it. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I found when I ran some data recovery tools on it was a search that Joshua had performed or whoever was using Josh's computer. And my understanding is that he used, when he was logged in under his name, that it was him using it. So I have every reason to believe that this was a Joshua Gimone search. And he searched for Abby statute of limitations conspiracy wow and this is in line with what the parents said he was doing his paper on mm -hmm. this date also coincides with the major settlement of sexual abuse claims made by i believe 12 victims against 11 different perpetrators on campus so We've got this October of 2002 search that Joshua is performing. We've got this paper that he's said to be writing. Mm -hmm. We have a major settlement on campus. Was that one of the, would you call that being that you're the authority on this, would you call that a major milestone in what has gone on, you know, with all of these, these charges over the years? Was that October 2002 to me sounds like a big deal. It's a huge deal because it was the, it was St. John's took credit. Here's the thing: St. John's mm. took credit in October of 2002 for doing the right thing. The Abbot at the time, and he's still there as Abbot. Abbot John Clausen took credit for doing the right thing and finally addressing sexual abuse in a way that was fair, in a way that was compassionate, in a way that was was honest. And this is what was sold by St. John's and others to the community, the St. John's community. And it was all it was all a lie. It wasn't compassionate, it wasn't fair, and it wasn't honest. That this was this was the end of the story, really. It was being presented as the end of the story that finally we had reached the end and that we could all start moving on. And one of the things that they did as a result of this large settlement was to name eight people to a review board that moving forward would be in place to address all future claims of misconduct and would really help the abbot clean up what was left of the filth uh, at St. John's. And so it was hailed as this major uh, achievement that would be duplicated and replicated around the country, if not the world, of how to handle sexual abuse in a compassionate pastoral manner. And as time has passed since 2002, we've come to realize that that wasn't the, the end of anything, but it was, it was merely just a continuation to the lies that had been told the whole time and continue to be told. Right. So, so did Joshua Gimone know more than the average student about sexual abuse and sexual misconduct on campus? I believe so. He had conversations, I'm told, with his parents about it. I'm told that he was, he was writing a paper about it. I don't mm -hmm. have evidence of that, but even mm -hmm. without evidence of a paper, we still know that, that conversations were being, were being had. And he had been speaking with uh, monks on campus who he he had developed friendships with. And so we know that he had an awareness. We also know that on the outside, St. John's was being presented as a model, but on the inside, there was much turmoil regarding this settlement in October of 2002. And the review board that was being named and there were monks on campus who were furious with what decisions were being made for them and by the, the attorneys. Mm -hmm. And they wanted 
nothing to do with it. There were monks who threatened to quit the monastery because of this latest settlement. That the monk, that the abbot had overstepped his bounds and that, that uh, you know, this wasn't the answer and that their rights had been violated. So there were monks on campus who were furious. With, this, oct with this October tw uh, 2002 decision? Correct. Okay. And then a month later, Josh disappears. Out on a, a Saturday night, playing cards with his buddies, just ups and disappears. They think he's going back to his dorm, or they think he's going to the bathroom. They decide that he probably went back to his dorm, being that he doesn't come back, and then he's never been seen since. Um, were you happy? I mean, you know, uh, do you think that the search, we don't have to go into all the specifics and the days and everything, but do you think that there was an adequate enough search done on the St. John's campus after he disappeared? Well, I, no, I don't. I mean, okay. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't think there was an adequate enough search done on campus or the investigation regarding his disappearance was handled appropriately. It, it, you know, when, when the law enforcement calls back to the dorm room and asks for the password for a student's computer, I mean, in 2002, if you are a police investigator and you need a password to see what was happening on somebody's computer, you don't know much about computers. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just, first of all, um, there, there, were, there were missteps along the way. There were mm -hmm. people who weren't interviewed. There were people that, you know, there were things that were going on. And we know that Joshua's hard drive was, things were deleted from it, that it was whitewashed. I think that was the name of the program. But we, we know that his computer was used and tampered with. Uh, the night he disappeared and into the following days. We knew that, the, you know, everybody, I can't say everybody, mm. there was evidence of fake IDs being made. There was, mm -hmm. you know, there were delays and, you know, the... Mm. I guess what it's safe to say, if somebody went to his computer and deleted stuff, obviously it wasn't the person who was involved with the fake ID stuff because that stuff was still there. Well, it was recovered. Though. It was recovered, it yeah. Was, yeah, I believe it was deleted, but it was recovered. Some of that stuff was... Mm -hmm. yeah. But very well but, could have been done by Josh himself at some point. No, because it was done. A lot of the things that were deleted were deleted in the hours after he disappeared. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. In the days after he disappeared. So it, it, I think the thing that bothers me the most, especially more recently, is we've learned what was and wasn't done in the disappearance of Jacob Wetterling. Right. If you hold that same spotlight to law enforcement and you look at the Joshua Gimone disappearance, I think it's safe to say that, again, in hindsight being 2020, that mistakes were made and things that should have been done weren't done uh, with regard to Joshua. Now, what just for the for the listeners is what Pat is talking about is that Jacob Wetterling's the the police that were investigating his original disappearance in 1989 is the same coincidentally the same police department that um, has investigated Josh Guiman's disappearance, right? right? So 1989. Sorry, I'll do that again. Right. So in 1999. Jacob Wetterling disappears, and the, the law enforcement agency, one of them, in fact, the, the first on the scene is the Stearns County Sheriff. And it's now well documented that mistakes were made in that investigation. And you would hope that, that they would have gotten better at their craft and that, that they would have some advances and some understanding of investigative techniques and what needed to be done when someone went missing. But now we're, you know, 13 years later in 2002 and Joshua Gimon disappears from campus mm. and you know when we when as we've gone when, as we've looked at who was who wasn't uh, interviewed who was you know what questions were asked what happened with the hard drive what happened with his personal belongings and we 
examine who had access to him that night and who was interviewed with regard to his disappearance. Hmm. I, I think that history will show at some point that mistakes, like in the Jacob Wetterling disappearance, hmm. mistakes were made. And I believe that when the case is examined and people are questioned, or even had they been questioned, that we would that that there were pieces of this puzzle that were missed, and because they were missed, we may never solve the case. I mean, My. the public, few members of the public, very few members of the St. John's community, and I don't even think law enforcement is aware that the faculty resident at the housing area where Joshua was playing cards, mm -hmm. and the faculty resident at the dorm where Joshua was heading were both staffed by credibly accused monks. So you have Josh leaving a building and that building, their faculty resident, resident is a credibly accused mm -hmm. monk. And he's going across campus and he's going to show up at a, at a place where he's lived for at least that year I believe the year before, but at least that year, he's he's in the presence and is, is being overseen by a monk who is also credibly accused. So just that night, you've got two locations going from and he's going to, and both, both of them are staffed by monks who've been credibly accused of misconduct. And I would bet most everything that I have that neither of those two monks were appropriately interrogated by the police. And we know a lot of this, just once again for the listeners and the record, is because we know a lot of these missteps in the Jacob Wetterling case because a recent uh, episode of the new show, In the Dark, that is covering all of that. In the second episode, they talk about how the police basically fumbled the investigation from the day it happened. And the, and the Jacob Wetterling case could have been solved in 1989, possibly. Well, worse than that, it could have been prevented. And right, that's something right, that we, right. look, we look at in the Joshua Gimon case. If you're going to staff a, a student housing uh, complex with a – and the person that's over, going to oversee it is a credibly accused monk, and you're going to staff another student housing complex with another monk who is credibly accused, you run the risk of missteps and um, – additional misconduct. And I'm not saying that either of these two men took Joshua that night or did something that led to his disappearance, but I'm also saying that we don't know what their story was that night. And what's frustrated me the most about the law enforcement in that community and in that area is the lack of oversight and the lack of seriousness paid to the um, horrendous acts of misconduct that have taken place that over the last several decades. And when something like Joshua occurs, when Josh disappears in 2002, mm -hmm. to not look at the history of St. John's and say, we might have an issue here that's bigger than just a student walking from point A to point B and he disappears. If you understand the history and you respect the history, you have to look at who had access to him that night. And two of the people that had access to him because of their jobs are credibly accused monks. Mm -hmm. They had to have been looked at. We don't believe they were. We don't know their story. We don't know the truth. Being that you've been covering this for so long, since obviously since the early 90s, and have been trying to you know get all of this stuff on the record so more people know about St. John's University, do you remember where you were in 2002 when you heard about this disappearance? And what did you think happened at the time? Not necessarily now, but at the time. What was your knee-jerk reaction? Do you remember it? I do, and I, I actually spoke with one of the law enforcement uh, a deputy for the Stearns County Sheriff, and and I asked him, and I asked, what what do you think happened? And he said, you know, he made me answer first. He said, what do you think happened? 
And I said, I think one of the monks uh, probably was drinking. There's a long history of, of alcohol abuse uh, documented in an, in an incredible letter uh, article that was written in 1981. Uh, we can get back to that, but there was, mm-hmm. a, there was there's a long history of alcohol on campus by the monks. Mm. And I suggested that one of the monks um, had too much to drink that night, probably or could have hit Joshua with one of the vehicles, the, the Abbey's fleet of vehicles. And because of the long history of misconduct on campus, they could not afford black mark against them. Mm-hmm. And the decision was made to cover it up as they've covered up so many other crimes so easily on campus. Especially given that a month before that they had said it's a whole new St. John's University. And they were lauded in the papers on TV for doing the right thing mm-hmm. and that the, the, this abbot, the leader of the monastery, had taken this this really a leadership, strong leadership position regarding sexual abuse and was made to look like a saint almost. Um, and they just mm-hmm. couldn't, they couldn't handle bad publicity anymore. Mm-hmm. And so it was easier in my mind to cover up. So that was my first thought mm-hmm. to this day. And what we just spoke about where he had one um, left a building that was being overseen by one perpetrator monk who was heading to another building that was overseen by a second perpetrator monk. I don't believe that my story is regarding the possibility that two men might have had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. My theory that a monk who was drinking could have hit him with a vehicle, uh, my theory still works because both of those men um, have drinking problems. So, mm-hmm. And everyone should know, and I would urge you all who are listening to this to check out, obviously if you don't live in the area of Collegeville, but if you can check it out on Google Maps, you know, that's it's a little bit of a windy walk from one of those buildings to the other one. You have to go out around that lake and go across that bridge and go right along that road that leads right into the center of campus and you could see on a you know on a late Saturday night if it's dark, somebody who's been drinking a little bit could easily hit a pedestrian. You know, to me, you know, it's amazing, sure. to, amazing to me that after all these years that they haven't built like a, a walking bridge across that lake or something. Being that you have to go so far around, you know, to get to campus if you're at one of those other dorms. It's not. It's not a. Uh... It's not a. It's, it certainly wasn't then, and being yeah. it was dark, and you know, it's yeah. you know, we don't know what Josh was wearing. We don't know mm. if he even you know we don't know what happened to him, so we don't even know if he made it to the bridge. Right, uh, right. But certainly, but certainly, on that campus, there are plenty of roads that use better sidewalks, especially at that time, and better lighting. And a lot of those improvements have been made. Yeah, but. You know, it, the theory of uh, Joshua being hit by a car and having that crime covered up, that's, you know, that's that's a theory. That's just and it's a theory. It's just theories. a theory. It's just a theory. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of many, and it's one that, you know, I would love to, I, I would love to rule it out, but I'd yeah. love to rule everything out. I, th- I think we've spent 14 years... Um, speculating, and the speculation has to end. But I think in order, uh, and what we've, it, when I met with a member of Joshua's family this past weekend, what we agreed to was that the speculation has to end. And mm-hmm. One way to end the speculation is to actually put the theories out there. So Joshua's website will soon be updated to include the theories as to what could have happened That's to him so that somebody who has information about this case will google his name look at the theories and say hey either theory seven is what happened and i want to i feel comfortable enough now to come forward because somebody's already thought of it 
or they'll look at the nine theories and they'll say, yeah, but you didn't think about theory 10, and this is what really happened. We're hoping that by putting the theories out there, we can, it, it, they're all speculation, but mm -hmm. we want to, we want to document the speculation so that we can end the speculation. Because the, the thing that I despise the most and has wasted so much of my time over the years is just idle mm -hmm. speculation that goes nowhere. Yeah. And so, you know, when I agreed to talk with you, I, 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 yeah. I do want to put out there a few of these theories because it's important for people to realize that we really don't know what happened. We do know that Josh was interested in sexual abuse on campus. We do know that he sought justice. We knew we know that he was a fair kid and he was very well liked and respected. We know that he had friends. We know that he enjoyed, he liked to drink, that he liked to smoke cigars, and that he liked to have a blast. And sometimes did it in excess. Mm -hmm. But he was a loyal friend and he cared about other people and he had career aspirations. You know, he wanted to do something with his life. And that was stopped in November of 2002. And there are a lot of people who care about this story and care about finding an answer so that, you know, his legacy, you know, it could be properly documented. You mentioned uh, run, uh, meeting his parents this past weekend. And by the way, we are doing this interview on September 21st. Uh, but this past weekend, you met them. How are they doing? Um, you know, uh, uh, it's been 14 years. I, I know, you know, being that I've talked to parents recently of lost parent or lost children to disappearances. Um, how are the how are the the Guimons doing these days? So this past weekend, I met with uh, Grandpa Bob, Grandpa Bob Gimon, and I uh, had, had the opportunity over the last 14 years to have many conversations with him and meet in person with him on many occasions. And he's a fantastic man, and he's, he's really taken this, um, the disappearance of his, his grandson um, as a personal mission. He, he wants to find Joshua, obviously. And he would like to do it, you know, he's, he's getting up there in age, and as is his wife and other members of the family, and, and they just want some answers. Mm -hmm. And what happened this past weekend, we actually decided to get together because of the recent um, exposure that the law enforcement in Stearns County has received, and wanted to really see what we could do to put the spotlight back on Joshua's case and perhaps the spotlight on the environment at St. John's and put the spotlight on law enforcement and, and really look at what everybody can do. What, what can we do as people concerned about Joshua's disappearance? What can we do as far as that relates to sexual abuse and other misconduct on campus? And what can we do to push the law enforcement to to do the right thing, um, to assist with this case. Um, it, it, as far as how are they doing, mm -hmm. you know, you lost you lost your buddy 14 years ago. Yeah. You know, yeah. parts of the family believe he's still alive. Um, or I should say members of the family, some members of the family believe that Josh is still alive. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's amazing what time can do. I mean, when you don't have answers, you're willing to turn to different resources to find those answers, whether it be psychics or ESP or, uh, you know, early on and even more recently I've heard about, you know, dowsing, dowsing rods and mag magnets and answers which come from things that, you know, normally we don't find answers about missing kids um, using these techniques. No. But when a family has spent so long and has had so few answers, I mean, no answers yeah. at all. He leaves point A and he doesn't show up at point B, and there's nothing in between to say this might have happened. Yeah. And so you, they hope, you know, it's, 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 uh, now, I just don't have my Wetterling quote here, but 
you know, it's like Patty Wetterling said recently. You know, she said, for us, Jacob was alive until we found him. Yeah. And the Gimons have to be, certainly are thinking the same thing. I mean, the hope is there. They want him to be alive. But as time passes and no contact is made, certainly the worst case is crossing their mind. And if, 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 if a psychic or a similar technique says that he's still alive and can give them hope, you know, they probably are going to listen to that. Yeah. You know, this, remi- so. this reminds me so much of my conversation that I had with Kelly Murphy, the mother of Jason Jolkowski, who, of course, started Project Jason. She appeared on a recent episode of my show. And in her son's case, it's very much the same thing, that he was here one second, was walking from his house to the local high school to get a ride, and somewhere in between, he just disappeared. And his was in broad daylight on a, a Tuesday or a Wednesday with no you know, sexual abuse claims all around in that area or anything like that. So I, I, I totally hear what you're saying, and I, you know, I, I understand um, what the family's saying as well. But then when you add up everything that was <clears throat> happening at the time or has happened in those locations, and we know that St. John's has a – long, dark, I wanted to say rich history of sexual abuse on campus. It has been home to dozens and dozens of pedophile and sexual deviants. Mm -hmm. We don't know which one of those, how many of them were on campus that night or Josh might have run into previously. We know that in the area there has been cult activity we know in the area there have been rings of pedophiles. We know in the, in, the ring, in the area that there have been disappearances, you know, until mm-hmm. recently unsolved. Mm-hmm. And so to, you know, to, so you've got your best cases of why he might have disappeared and how, and you have your worst cases. And sadly, because it happened on the campus of St. John's University, home to the St. John's Monastery, mm. you know, the likelihood that it was something toward the evil side, you know, rather than the innocent mistake side, is more likely. Um, and that's just based on the history of the place. Yeah. But we don't know. You know, in the end, we don't know. And that's the, that's the sad part for the family, and that's the sad part for his friends. You know, hopefully, it, you know, someday they'll have an answer. They'll have some closure, and hopefully, you know, the people who covered it up, the, per- the people who per- perpetrated his disappearance, and the, who helped him get away with it, will be held accountable. Right. Right. Let's talk about your website, behindthepinecurtain.com. How long has that been around, and what? And when you started it, what was the motivation? Obviously, you've been dealing with this uh, since your abuse in the early 1980s and then coming forward in 1990-91. But how long has the website had been around, and what was the final motivator to get it started? It was 2002 when I actually created the website. At that point, it was called the Abuse Disclosure Project. And I was just tired of, of, well, tired of two things. I was exhausted from listening to the stories of victims, number one. Mm-hmm. But I was tired of the attention that wasn't being paid to the problem at St. John's. And so I created the website in an effort to lead people, to direct them to this resource. When they called me or they searched the Internet, they would find it. I knew that people were seeking, seeking answers. And they hadn't no place to turn. They could call me if they knew me and they, you know, could research it in one way or the other and somehow come up with my name. But I had spoken with enough people and enough people had contacted me that I knew that a resource was necessary. And so I just, I put together a website of, uh, I think at that point it was eight or nine perpetrators. And I was aware way back in the early nineties of, of these eight perpetrators and of well over 40 victims. And I think at that point in the early 2000s, I was still dealing with that about the same number, eight, mm-hmm. nine perpetrators, 40 or 50 victims. 
and I had no idea it was going to take off and become almost 100 perpetrators and well over 300 victims. Um, but, you know, that that's the website was there as a resource mm-hmm. for people who needed answers and who late at night had just needed somebody to talk to or they just needed something to see that validated their experience. And that's that's the number one word that I tend to use when talking about sexual abuse is validation. Victims many times don't need a lawsuit, don't need a settlement, don't need counseling. They simply need validation, knowing that what happened to them did actually happen, that it happened to others, that they're not alone, they didn't bring it on themselves. And a lot of times that's all they need. And that's mm-hmm. all I wanted to provide was just a validation for those people who needed it. Mm-hmm. So as time went on, people would, would come to the website and they'd, they'd tell me their story, send me a message, give me a call, ask that I call them. And, and the, the list got bigger and the number of victims increased. And it really became something that you know, it's a sad project. You know, every time yeah. you add a, a perpetrator's name, um, every time you, know, you speak to a, just another victim or to a victim's um, family member, you know, it's 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 amazing the stories that I've heard. There were two. There were, there's a. There, I'm thinking of a family. They have three boys in the family. They actually have more family members, but I don't want to give anything away here. Mm-hmm, but I understand. Talk about these three boys. Well, two of the boys, uh, I, I'll go back to the third. But a, a, a kid calls me up. You know, I call him a kid because in a lot of ways he's still a kid because he hasn't mm-hmm. dealt with his abuse. And because of that, he's he's in a place in his life where he hasn't grown up past the age of his abuse. And that happens to a lot of people. So I say, and this kid calls up. And he says, you know, I've I had this incident with this priest and I don't know what to do. So we talk about it for a while and I listen to him, and he, he gives me the name of the priest, and he says, listen, I'd love to come forward and tell my story. I'd like to use it, but I can't use my name because I come from this family. I say, that's fine. You don't have to use your name. Um, he says, well, I, I'm, I'm concerned because I, you know, I don't you – know, I've got, I've got these brothers, and I'm just concerned about them. And I don't know if the concern was this something happened to them. I think he, he suggested to me that something might have happened. But he was worried about going through the whole process. He wanted to be, as many people do, he wanted to be anonymous. Um, and I said, certainly, whether you come talk to me or you go see an attorney or you talk to a therapist, whatever you do, you know, you your confidentiality, is, is that's that's part of the puzzle. That's, that's assured if you mm. need that to happen. And so I said, you know, feel comfortable doing whatever you want to do. And he said that, you know, he was worried about that. And he thought, you know what, I, I can't go forward. In, in the end, he said, I can't go forward with this because I'm just afraid that my name will be made public. And what I couldn't tell him was that his brothers had already gone through the process. Oh, my. Oh, my. Both of them, both of those brothers had already settled claims against oh the Abbey. Oh, my gosh. And here he was, what a third story. brother in the family, and he couldn't come forward and never did come forward because he didn't want his name to get out there. And I couldn't tell him anything. No. I just had to say, you know, that's just, you, whenever you're ready to talk, I'm willing to talk. I said, there are other resources out there. And, and you know, he said, you know, maybe call me back sometime. I haven't spoken to him since, but, I, mm-hmm. you know, it's no different from a family there's a family in the area, and I've spoken with four members of the family. None of the four know that the other three have spoken with me. All four were abused by the same priest. None of the four knows each other has been abused. And it's stories like that that talk to, speak to. I mean, here, here's here's an interesting piece to this puzzle. This may help you understand okay. sexual, sexual abuse better. Mm-hmm. The number one reason I feel why people don't report sexual abuse and come forward is because they're afraid to, of shaming their parents. Oh, I'm going to wait till my parents die, and then I'll do something about it. Oh, it would break my mother's heart. Oh, my parents are so Catholic. Mm-hmm. Children do not want to embarrass or shame their parents. They will 
they will take on all the crap that comes along with being a victim and moving toward being a survivor. But if it means that their parents will be shamed or embarrassed, they won't do it. And because of it, they're suffering from issues with alcohol, with drugs, marital issues, uh, problems with their jobs, and in some cases, sexual abuse of their own doing. They've, they've grown mm. up with, sexu- with, with problems with sexuality because they didn't deal with their own sexuality appropriately or they were taught about sexuality from the wrong person. And as a result, they've, they've got on this path that, that is dysfunctional in all those aspects of life. And one of the things that I've tried to do with my website and my advocacy is to say that, you know, we need to break these cycles for all of those five reasons. I don't, if, if we can keep somebody from drinking or from doing drugs or we can help their marriage or we can help them be more peaceful in their job and by heaven's sakes, if we can keep them from acting inappropriately with another person, minor or otherwise, then we need to do that. So that's the, that's the root of what I do is I try to take people off of this cycle of dysfunction that they're on and to see that there's another way and only by providing them with validation for their own stories and to let them know that they're not alone um, and to let them know that the truth is is it's such a gift Mm -hmm. And, you know, and and once we find out the truth and and the truth about what happened to Josh is more likely to be told if we know the truth about St. John's. But the truth about St. John's is so buried and is so far from the surface. And if that's what's required in order to bring Josh back or to find out what happened to him, we'll never know what happened to him. No. It's only once St. John's decides that it's time to tell the truth, to, to come with forward, full disclosure. It's only then that Josh and other bodies, in quotes, that have been buried, you know, that we find out what happens to them. What is the most recent graduate of St. John's that has approached you about being abused? There was a gentleman who graduated from St. John's University this past spring. He was the uh, recipient of uh, sexual harassment slash misconduct during his freshman year. He reported it. It went up the chain. His perpetrator was pulled and was retrained and was placed back in the dorm. my understanding is works there again this year. So that is the most recent Hmm. episode of misconduct, of sexual harassment or, you know, things that are inappropriate on campus. Before then, uh, one of the priests, Fanny McDonald, acted inappropriate. This is the gentleman, by the way, that had confessed to having over 200 sexual encounters many of them overseas and many of them with underage kids who wore numbers so that he could pick them out of a lineup and say, I'd like that one. Oh my. And he was inappropriate, touched the crotch area and played with the zipper of one of the employees at St. John's a couple of years ago. And as a result, he was shipped off campus to Missouri and to a place in, I believe it was Dittmer, Missouri, to a facility that is nicknamed Club Ped, because that's where the worst of the Catholic pedophile priests go. And served some time there, and then they sent him to a nursing home in northern Minnesota, which I had the uh, opportunity to visit just after he left, and they said, oh, he's a great man. We enjoyed having him here. And I said, well, were you aware that he is a multiple accused perpetrator of sexual abuse against minors? And the lady's jaw dropped. Oh, my. Like, I had no idea. Um, 
I'm not sure where he is now. I've heard he's back on campus. I hope that's not the case. But there are many perpetrators, many credibly accused men, perpetrators of sexual misconduct against minors and others who are on campus right now, walking, interacting with students. St. John's won't tell you their names. They won't provide pictures. Um, we don't know who they are. I know who they are, but uh, mm. the, the general public, general population, the kids who are visiting for um, soccer camp, kids who are there for the football games, the kids who are there for the choir, people who are in the seats at church, they don't know who these men are. Um, and they're allowed to take vehicles, drive to local uh, St. Cloud establishments, um, mm -hmm. do their shopping and come home. The oversight is poor at best and the community should be frightened. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's, it is a, it, it's not a question of if it will happen again, it's a question of when. They will reoffend. These are, these are serious sexual perpetrators. So the preponderance of the evidence would say that probably right as we're talking, something's going on at St. John's University right now. Well, I say yes, but I, I qualify by saying this. If, if you're on campus, your son or daughter is on campus now, and more likely your son or daughter is going to be the, the victim here. But if, if they're at the uh, cafeteria right now or mm -hmm. in the locker room at the gym mm -hmm. or walking campus looking at the, at the, at the leaves turning, there's a monk nearby, more likely than not, in one of those places. And even if your son isn't being fondled right now, he's still being looked at inappropriately by one of these gentlemen who has been charged with being a good community member and took vows as part of their priesthood to, do, to be a good man. And instead, they're undressing your son and that's inappropriate. So is a child, is a student, is somebody being victimized at St. John's right now? Yeah, they are. But, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. I would hope that um, it's happening on the sidewalk and that it's it's something that doesn't involve, you know, the touching, the inappropriate touching or the grooming or that they're not getting them, you know, providing them with alcohol so that they can, you know, compromise them later. I can tell you this, is somebody on campus right now being groomed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Will that grooming result in misconduct? I hope not. I can't say mm -hmm. definitely not. I hope not. But are they being groomed? I'm going to say 100% yes, because what these men do is groom. That is their MO, that is their way of life, and they that's what they do they groom they groom all day long was joshua gimon being groomed yeah he was was his groomer serious about doing something probably um did his, his groomer have the opportunity we'll never know but certainly because that's what these guys do mm -hmm. is groom that's their day their day is who can i groom whether it be somebody in their own monastic community, you know, or a student or the son or daughter of one of their friends. Yeah, they're groomers. That's what they do. So and that's an important thing to, to, to think about, too. That's what these guys do. And it's just, you know, the, the guy who got me back in the 80s, he was grooming at least three. My two best friends, he was grooming them. And he probably had, well, he had a student body of, you know, several dozen kids to groom. And then they narrow it down. And at some point it becomes, who's the vulnerable kid that I can now take advantage of? I spent all of this time grooming these dozens or these dozen or this half dozen, and they've narrowed it down, and then they're just looking for opportunity. The grooming is going on. The grooming is there. Now they're just waiting for opportunity. They're waiting for somebody to be vulnerable. And when they're vulnerable, there's an opportunity, they've been properly groomed, they will strike again. It's just a matter of time. Patrick Marker, tell everyone uh, how they could find you, how to contact you, your information, anything you want to put out there uh, before we uh, sign off on this interview for today. 
Well, the website that I started back in 2002 is now called Behind the Pine Curtain. It's, it's meant to be a resource for victims. I, I simply try to validate their stories, try to tell the stories that St. John's doesn't want the public to hear, whether it be sexual abuse or elder abuse, um, their fundraising uh, issues, um, the fact that their beloved coach John Gallardi knew about sexual abuse back in the 50s and 60s, and that like him and other faculty members just didn't do enough or anything about it. And because of that, the entire community has been affected. The entire community needs to be healed. But the only way that healing takes place is if we get to the truth. And I've merely tried to provide with the website a starting point for that truth. So mm-hmm. behind the pine curtain is where people should go. Mm-hmm. I look forward to any input and feedback and help that uh, anybody wants to provide. Um, it's been a it's it's been a real honor to speak with victims and their families and to have that trust put into me, uh, put in me, so that uh, these people can be relieved of their own stories and guilt and shame and and, and uh, really it's it's just mm-hmm. an opportunity for for me to give back. Um, yeah. And I appreciate the ability to do so. Do you have email? Is that the uh, only thing you're prepared to give out at this time? Not oh, force. No, no, no. There's mm-hmm. a contact page on the website. Okay, great. Uh, my phone number's on there. I think my email address is on there. And there's certainly okay. a contact page. They can send me a message anytime. Great. So, uh, Patrick, thank you for coming forward, and thank you for everything that you've done since to help all of these victims and their families. Thank you so sure. much. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for being on Unfound. And that was my 2016 interview with Patrick Marker from Behind the Pine Curtain. I thank him for joining me and all of you way back at the beginning of Unfound's existence. I've not spoken to him since I'm thinking 2017. I've tried to contact him a few times, but he has never gotten back to me. I don't believe there is any ill will of any kind between us. So I'd certainly like to catch up with him. So Patrick, if you're listening, email me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. Also, in 2020, I made a map video for Josh's disappearance. You can find it on the Unfound Podcast channel on YouTube. As preparation for the interview with Dr. Telesco, I went back and looked at what I had said in Volume 2 of Season 1 of the Unfound book series. To see what I wrote in the observations section of the chapter on Josh's disappearance. What conclusion did I come to when I completed that book? I think I finished that book sometime in 2018. So, what did I write? I decided that Josh had tried to walk back to his dorm while intoxicated. He stumbled into the creek that he had to go over. Somebody on the college staff discovered his body. There was a cover-up, due to St. John's wanting to keep its newly created image intact. As I wrote, covering up the accidental drowning of a student is easy compared to the covering up of sex abuse by dozens of monks. Technically, an accidental drowning isn't even a crime, so I'm not even sure if the school could get in trouble, even if Josh really did drown and they covered it up. Why did I pick that theory? Because people, if they are drunk, do drown in bodies of water, and they do this all on their own despite what the smiley face killer conspiracy theorists believe. I lived in Las Vegas for over 13 years. It was a monthly occurrence that a drunk boater would drown out at Lake Mead. Drunk people can't swim. So I coupled that fact with the fact that the school had a long history of covering stuff up to protect its image. I put those two separate facts together, drunks and cover-ups, to form my theory. That's how I did it. Yet, that theory isn't perfect. In fact, none are, because we do not have enough facts. 
there is a lot of what I call wiggle room. The main problem with my own is, so Josh drowns and a staff member is the first person who just happens to come upon his body. What are the odds of that? Students probably outnumber faculty, the monks, and security 20 to 1. But someone who isn't a student finds Josh in the creek or lake. Yeah, somewhat improbable. However, it wasn't until my discussion with Dr. Telesco, and I think this shows how I continue to learn right along with all of you, that my mind contemplated some other confounding facts. Number one, so Josh walked out of that dorm and nobody saw him on the streets anywhere. It was a Saturday night at 11 p.m. Where were the other students? Even at Grove City College, where I went to school, as sleepy a college as that was, on Saturday night, there would be people walking around at 11 o'clock. Yet, no one saw Josh. This is a topic that now often comes up when a witness claims, yeah, she just left. I don't know what to tell you. The response, well then, why didn't anyone see her? Number two. In my talk with Dr. Telesco, she showed pictures of the security apparatus that Nova Southeastern University has. Hundreds of cameras, a large staff. I realize it was 2002, but did St. John's have no security measures at that time? Not even one video camera on campus near where Josh should have been? I wonder. You will notice that topic didn't even come up with Patrick Marker. That's my fault, not his. I think it shows how my interviewing technique has improved since then, if nothing else. Number three, and this is going to sound familiar, in the month before Joshua disappeared, he and his girlfriend of five years had broken up. Once again, something not covered in the original interview. Automatically, I think of Devin Bond, Jake Lachalet, Sky Burnley, and frankly, Tom Brown. Disappearances of young men that occurred right after a relationship ended. To put it in 21st century lingo, this seems to be a thing. A thing I probably didn't realize back in 2016 when I started Unfound. The problem? Yes, we know Devin committed suicide. But with Tom, still no cause of death. And the other two, they haven't been found, dead or alive. The main problem with these three good points? They are contradictory. If no one saw him outside the dorm, then something happened inside of it. Yet, I have a hard time believing a group of people could keep a secret this long. Likewise, if he really did leave the dorm, then somebody should have seen him. So, after four and a half years, what does your education tell you? What my education tells me is when I run into contradictions like this, I check my assumptions. And doing so causes me to consider this. Maybe Joshua planned to disappear and avoided everyone once leaving the dorm. Or he left that group of friends but didn't actually leave the dorm itself at 11 o'clock. I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Densel, and you've been listening to Unfound.